Welcome again to the Best of the Oprah Show. You know, there are disturbing statistics that tell us that every single day in our country, the United States, three women are killed by an intimate partner, at least three. And for every three who are murdered, many others are stalked, they are brutalized or terrorized. And these women who survived and lived to tell about it shared their chilling stories on our show time and time and time again with the hope that something happening to them that was so horrifying could help you not let it happen to you. My guests today have all survived brutal attacks by their exes. Geraldine Dover shot her boyfriend five times when he broke into her apartment to kill her. She told the judge she wanted to go to prison to get away from her obsessed ex, who repeatedly told her that if I can't have you, no one can. And in just one week, Patty's ex-husband will be released from prison, where he has served four years for trying to kill her. Her ex burned down her friend's house because he thought that Patty was in the house. Patty still receives letters from him and is frightened of what he'll do once he gets out. And when Robin Oswald told her husband that she wanted a divorce, he savagely attacked her. In an excerpt from a letter that she sent me, Robin describes that assault. She says, as I saw the blade coming down toward my head, I thrust my hand up in its path, and all I knew was the scissors had to be stopped. My hand fell lifeless and numb unto the bed, my fingers slashed to the bone. With a crazed look, my husband began wildly chopping off huge clumps of my hair. During this frenzy, I was stabbed deeply in the top of my head. My husband then dragged me into our bathroom, held me down to the sink for one hour, the stab wound bleeding profusely, and he shaved my head, entirely bald. Had his grotesque attack ended the way he'd planned, my body would have been unrecognizable. Welcome all of my guests to the show. We're glad to have you. So his, his plan was to do what? What was his plan, Robin? Well, the, uh, the final plan was to uh, pour gasoline over my body and light me on fire. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you know this? Is that what he told you? During the procedure of shaving my head, which lasted almost an hour, I continued bleeding profusely from the stab wound and he talked incessantly describing in a graphic detail what his plan was. What stopped him? What stopped him was the fact that um, for one reason the stab wound itself, the bleeding um, distracted him from from completing the, the procedure as quickly as he had intended to and so during the period of time that he was cleaning up the mess from this this blood that was just spurting about two feet from my head. Did you remain conscious the whole time? I, I was conscious throughout mm -hmm. the ordeal and at a point when he had almost about a cubic inch of hair left to shave he uh, like I say he was cleaning up the mess and so I was intensely praying and at this point um, uh, it was as if the prayer was answered because I then began saying things to, th to my husband that I wasn't conscious that I was thinking of to say. And it was what I said to him that totally subdued him what did and you made say? him stop. I told him in an authoritative tone to, uh, to get into the shower that the water was going to make everything all right and that the water was going to cleanse and he had already stripped off all my clothing because my, my clothes were totally saturated in, in blood. And uh, he stopped at this point. He, we had one cubic inch of hair left. And as I was saying these words to him, um, get into the shower, as, as if I were speaking to a child, telling him what to do. And what made he, you say get into the shower? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. The, but he did it and that's the main point and he got into the shower and when he did I then um, turned the water on full blast and it directed at the nape of his neck and he turned his head away from me and under a low voice he was saying I know this is a trick I know this is a trick but then yet even though he was saying this he didn't make any effort to get away from me and he had had my head peeled, pinned down to a sink for for an hour and this uh, so that he could watch my every move and then now that he was in the shower he turned his head totally away from me for the first time over, in over an hour and when he turned his head away from me entirely then I jumped from the shower and 
ran through the, I had unlocked the bathroom door as soon as I had turned the shower on. I had reached around with my good hand and where he couldn't see me and unlocked the bathroom door and slid it halfway open and made a path ready. And then, so when I finished uh, adjusting the nozzle to his neck and he turned his head totally away from me and then repeated, I know this is a trick, I jumped from the shower and I ran through the bathroom door. And this was 4.30 in the morning, I got to my neighbor's home. Their door was unlocked because they had thought I was going to spend the night at their house. And my children were already there waiting for me asleep. <laughs> and so I was able to get into their house before he came banging on the door to break in. Hmm. And I'm here. <laughs> and where is he? He was just released from prison uh, this summer. And he's now remarried and, and living in another state. Does the woman he married, is she in any way aware of what he did to you? That I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it received uh, television coverage and it was such a, um, all of our friends knew about it, anyone that was associated with us knew about it. I don't see how she could not be aware. In fact, uh, she knew him at the point when the uh, trial took place. So she was aware that I had been assaulted in some way, but the specifics, I don't know that she knows. Mm -hmm. What kind of indication did you have prior to this time that something like this can happen? Well, in retrospect now, um, the evidence that I have is verbal abuse. There mm -hmm. was always verbal abuse, which I chose to ignore. Um, you tend to suppress things that you don't want to uh, accept and deal with. And so up until the point when I told him I wanted, him wanted a divorce from him, I had never decided to deal with, uh, with the reality of our situation. Mm -hmm. And it was after you said, I want a divorce, that all of this happened? That's right. Uh -huh. Many threats? There, the only threats he had ever made had been against other people. He was the type of person, he was um, working on his master's degree in family counseling at the time this happened. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and he was also an officer in the armed services. Mm -hmm. And so this, to other people, appeared totally out of character. But um, the threats that he made in the past were always to other people. He was the type of person that would say, any man that ever lays an abusive finger on a woman should be uh, castrated, was his method of dealing with abuse. So where did this come from? We you, don't know, but we'll- You we'll tell me. Yeah, <laughs> you tell me. We'll, we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. about really real life fatal attractions when someone you loved turns against you and it becomes uh, brutal harassment or in many cases women who could not be here fatal fatal harassment so patty in your case it was um it was pretty much the fatal attraction um i wasn't allowed to go anywhere or do anything unless he gave me permission. This is your husband? This was my husband, mm -hmm. yeah. I had gotten married to him when I was eight, two days after my 18th birthday, mm -hmm. which was he, what he said is, you will marry me because that way you will be mine. Mm -hmm. you're, you're mine now, you belong to me. So mm -hmm. we pretty, pretty much forced me to get married to him. Um, a fo the phone would ring and he'd scream my calls. If it was a man, he'd want to know why was this man calling me? And then he'd, you know, he'd get angry. He wouldn't believe the story that I said and he'd hit me until so did, mean, did the real abuse start, real abuse start, uh, did he be, or did he become more abusive after you decided to file for divorce or what? Um, the, it got pretty bad after we got married. It wasn't, it was, it just seemed like jealousy at first while we were dating and it was okay. It didn't really, I could brush it off. But after we got married, it seemed to get worse. Um, I wasn't able to divorce him until I got him put in jail for the, he attempted to kill me and my son. Mm -hmm. And that was the only way I could get away from him because I asked him for a divorce and he wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't let me do it, he wouldn't even let me, you know, I couldn't even start, sneak off and try to do it on my own. Mm -hmm. He knew where I was 24 hours a day and if he didn't. So did he try to kill you? Oh yeah, he um, gave me the thing, if I can't have you, nobody else can and you're gonna watch me go first mm -hmm. and then I'm gonna take you, you know. Which is what a lot of people experience. Yeah, and I was real scared. He um, went into the kitchen and got... Was that your husband's attitude too? If I can't have you, nobody That's else right. can. That's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. he'd, he'd gone into the kitchen to get a kitchen knife and made me sit there and watch him while he sliced up his stomach. Mm. And I had my four-month-old son and I kept trying to make a break for the door and every time he'd hit me real hard so I sat on the couch and finally just sat there 
and it wasn't sharp enough, it wasn't making deep enough cuts, so he threw it at me. He said, well, fine, I'm going to make you so ugly that nobody's going to watch you. Mm -hmm. And it's, he sliced my face. and it, the You've knife, heard that too? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The knife had come off of my face and hit my son, my four-month-old, in the face. So he, we both have scars. Mm -hmm. And at one point when he went back into the kitchen, I made the final break for the door and ran outside. And just nothing but un, you know my underwear and a bra, and my son had a diaper on, and it was raining. And he had barricaded him in the house, himself in the house. And the entire, a lot of the police department was there. My father had to come. My father was the only person that could talk him out of the house. And he went in for seven years, and he got out in six months. And, and so what was he in for seven years for? For the attempted, for the uh, uh, physical, mental abuse, and the attempted murder of my son and I. Mm -hmm. And he was out in six months because he was a model prisoner, and it was overcrowding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And so it, was it after that that he then tried, burned the house down? It was after. It was a little bit. He was probably out for almost a year. And he had pretty much left me alone, but I was getting phone calls, and he was harassing my friends. And he knew that I was over there one night, and he went there and broke in the house and tried and burnt the house down because I had been over there. And he didn't want me there anymore, so this was the way he was going to fix it. He wanted me with him because I wasn't with him. And he would. I would try to tell him where I was at, and he didn't believe it. And so if I, the only thing he would believe is if I would believe if I would make something up, and he would believe that, mm -hmm. but he wouldn't believe the truth. So, so after he you burned your friend's house down, did you start losing friends? I lost <laughs> all my friends. I was going to say, no, oh, if I walked I into say, don't come to my house. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah, so you start losing friends, oh, too. Oh, yeah. They yeah. wouldn't, if I went into a place where, mm -hmm. to a friend's house, or if we went into listen, to the bar or something, they would get up and move. They said, I'm sorry, but we cannot, we don't want to get beat up. Mm -hmm. And they would say how bad they felt for me and if they wished they could do something, but they, none of them would help. He would, he would go off on me with, with other friends around and they would stand back and watch while he hit me or pulled, you know, threw me down on the ground and called me names. And, and after a while I began to think that, well, maybe I'm doing something to deserve this. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's my fault. Mm -hmm. And I just, it was it. I so he went, in, he went to jail for the burning of the house? For the arson charge, right. Mm -hmm. And, and how got, long has he been there? He's been there four years, and he gets out Monday the 20th, I believe. Mm -hmm. And he's, got, he's paroled to Lake County, which is in the area where I'm at. And still trying to find you? And still yeah. keeping contact Keep, with you? Keeping contact. Uh, I'm going to read an excerpt from a letter that he wrote recently. This would be very disturbing to me if, if, if I were in your shoes. Patty, don't worry about... This was written September 21st, 1989. Don't worry about me hitting you. You know if you push my button, things might get hectic. I never enjoyed smacking you, but I will try to keep my hands off you, but you might get a spanking. I will do my best to abide by the rules you set down, but you must abide by mine. You know I'll be out of here in just days. Do you think you can go without sex until I get out? Patty, I love you, and I hope we can make things work. So what was your response to this letter? Um, at first, I just, it was, I was pretty numb because I just, I can't believe that he actually thinks that I'm going to go back to him. He's pr acting like there's nothing wrong, like nothing ever happened. And I just, my reaction, I was fear. What am I going to do? My, my son is involved. He's now six, and I don't know what I'm, my friends are all saying, well, move, leave. And I, I can't. Everything I have is here, and I shouldn't have to move. And I'm just really scared. There's nothing I can do about it. He's getting out. He's done his time. Okay, this is what I want to know from you. Because I hear this from women. I hear this. And I understand that it's not fair for you to have to move. It really is not fair. But uh, we're going to have on the brother of one woman who, for also, it was not fair. But the, the reality of the law is, is that there are not laws that are firmly enough, uh, firmly enough in place to protect women. So the reality is, if he's being let out and and no amount, amount of restrictive orders is going, to, is going to keep him from you. You know that. Yeah, so right. I, 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 I don't understand why not move. I know it's unfair and you shouldn't have to do it, but it's your life. It's your son's life. Yeah, but he, eventually he would probably find me anyway. Mm -hmm. I did run away at one point before he was in jail. I ran away to my mother's and I wasn't there a week and he was calling. Okay. So there's really nowhere I can go. And right, I, st I have protection of my father. He's been behind me. And I'm not quite as frightened as I used to be because he doesn't want to go back to jail. And I feel hopefully he'll just be a little bit more 
He doesn't want to go back to jail? Oh, no. But I'm I thought sure. he's, he, okay, so he was in jail before, before he right, burned the house he, down. He didn't think of it as, he didn't think he was going to go to jail for that. He didn't think he was going to get caught. But we, it, it's, he got caught, so he went to jail. And he's just, he's been Mr. Model Prisoner, not do any wrong. <clears throat> so but he was a model prisoner before he burned the house right. down. And but he's telling everybody that he's changed. He's talked to psychologists, I guess, psychiatrists. Does this letter sound like he's changed to you? No, not to me. Mm -hmm. But to, uh, to other people, it sounds like well, he looks like he's trying to make amends and he's really sorry for what he's done. So the thing should be, <laughs> you think he really should be kept behind bars? Uh, yeah, obviously. Well, we hear what we will hear. Why my next guest shot her ex. X is after you, and it happens a lot more than I guess a lot of people would care to, to recognize, because every <laughs> six hours, isn't that a startling figure, Geraldine? Yes, it is. Uh -huh. uh, my you shot yours five times. Yes, I shot him, but I didn't know the gun was loaded uh -huh. when I shot him. But what brought the incident up, we've been to living together for uh, three years, almost four years, and I wasn't aware of the uh, battered women's syndrome or the signals or signs of about abuse. It's just, it first started off verbal, then physical abuse. And then when he felt that he couldn't penetrate me anymore with the uh, physical abuse, then he started uh, slapping my son around. Mm -hmm. And uh, the day of the incident that it happened, uh, he, he broke into my home and attacked me. And I fled from my home to my car and he was running after me in my car and he fired a shot at me but I didn't realize that uh, one of the neighbors told me after after the whole thing happened that he fired a gun after uh, me after I left my uh, parking lot and I was on my way to my uh, parents house to uh, take my sister to physical therapy and to OT and uh, he followed me there to my parents house that's where I made my first mistake mm -hmm. by going to trying to get protection. And uh, right as I entered the, my parents' home, I told him, I said, he's after me again. I just can't get away from this man. He said he will kill me, my kids, and himself. And I kept, I bought a gun, not really to, to, for against him, but protection in my, in my home. And I always kept a gun underneath the uh, seat of my car. Uh, but I, when I looked around for the gun in my car, it was under the passenger seat with the cylinder open. And I didn't r look down at it to see was it loaded. I just knew it was just open because that's the way I always keep it, and it was open. So I'd taken it into my parents' house and I put it on top of the refrigerator. And here come Tim. He just <coughs> burst through the door and he, at my <coughs> sister. She starts screaming. I thought someone attacked her because she's paralyzed. Uh, she's a quadriplegic. And I ran into the front room, and it was him. And my mother was screaming, please get out, or we'll call the police. He said, I'm not going anywhere. I own her. She's mine. And my mother said, no, just, just leave. My sister was screaming. <coughs> I said, please, I'll just go outside. I said, just go outside. I'll be out there, because I want to protect my mother and my sister. And my father wasn't around because he was working. And I was the only one that could protect them. And he went outside. He dented my car. He beat my car with his fist. The police have pictures of it where he dented a brand new car with his fist and he stopped, he pushed in the door with his foot. And so I came outside because the previous day he slashed three of my tires. And I came out there, I said, Tim, please just leave from here. I'll go, I'll do anything you ask me. Just leave from down here because you're getting everyone upset. He said, your minds, I own you your minds. No one else will ever have you. I said, please, I had enough. I had enough. He said, I'll be better if you just take me back. I said, okay, I'll do anything. And then he proceeded in beating me out there in the street. Mm -hmm. And he just cracked me one good hard one in the head and it just seemed like I snapped. It's just like another person just merged out of me. I ran into the house. I was going to get my purse to beat him outside, but the gun was there. And I grabbed the gun off the refrigerator and I ran outside. And uh, I just pointed the gun and he said, you're one stupid bitch. You don't know how to use a gun because the cylinder was open. And I said, oh, I'm that stupid. And I just closed it. And I aimed at the car and I shot it. I mean, when I pulled the trigger, the gun discharged. And when it discharged, I just, I don't know, I just freaked out. And 
they said the gun kept going off, off, and he was still swearing at me. He said, you better not kill me because I'm coming back. I'm coming back to get you. I said, oh, God, I, I just, I just don't know. I just freaked out. But, but the swearing and the cussing stopped. And when the car swerved up on this playground light, I walked over toward the car. And with the gun still in my hand, I didn't realize I, I fired, fired the gun. But I leaned over, and I saw him, and his eyes was just fixed. And I said, oh, my God, I shot, I shot him. But after I shot him, it was such a good feeling. No more torment, no more cussing, no more beating. My little boy. I said, it's just like God has lifted us, lifted that burden from us. So I ran into the house. I called the police, and I called the uh, ambulance, and I said, I shot my ex-boyfriend. Please get some help. I don't want him to die. I'm not here to kill anyone. And so the ambulance arrived before the police did. And a good friend of the family, Frank Love, uh, he's a sergeant on the police force. He did come to my home several times. And he said, I knew it was coming to this point. Mm -hmm. He said, I knew it. He said, we have over 100 reports of you uh, reporting about abuse. And, but they did uh, uh, take him away to the hospital. They said he was dying. And uh, I felt so bad. And did he I, die? No. <laughs> he refused to die. They said his life force is so strong that he died. They said he, pat, he died twice on the operating table, but they brought him back. And Why? I, well, after I was released from jail, after my brother put up my bail to get me out, this man asked the judge, the doctors, I want to see her. I want to see her. And my attorney said, well, I don't know. Where is he it, now? This man is still alive. I taken care of him for three months. I'm a prisoner in my own home because his psychiatrist, his psychologist said, well, you did this to him, so you should take care of him. You should feel bad. And when do I stop being abused? <laughs>Lisa Bianco had been beaten for years by her former husband. She lived in daily fear that he would make good his threats to kill her. After she finally got her ex sentenced to five years in prison for his years of abuse, he then continued to phone her from prison to tell her what he planned to do to her when he got out. And each time he'd call, Lisa would report it to prison officials. They agreed to inform her if he ever got out, even on a short furlough. They did not. So when her ex got out on an eight-hour pass just months ago, he went right to Lisa's house, 150 miles away. Just last April, Lisa Bianca's body was found beaten to death by her ex-husband, who savagely bludgeoned her with a rifle butt outside her home. Ex-husband Alan Metheny was on an eight-hour release pass from prison, where he was serving time for assaulting Lisa. Once out on the pass, he headed straight for Lisa's house. We Before Lisa's murder, but after another beating by her ex, well, Lisa spoke to the attorneys point, during this I videotape am, statement, expressing her fear. I'm sort of torn in between. As I said, I bartered for my life yesterday and told him that I would not prosecute. Um, I'm afraid that if he does get a hold of me again, I'm not going to be able to talk him out of it. Lisa continued by telling of threats that her ex-husband had made. He was going to take my kids from me to where I would never see them again, and that he would make my life so miserable that I would wish daily that I was dead. Joining us is Lisa's brother, Mark Bianco. So your sister tried to get help, and the system failed her. Of course, the system failed her. Lisa done everything she could within the system, mm -hmm. and everything the system would allow. And, uh, yeah, the system did let her down. Mm -hmm. And so are you angry about that, or do you just accept that that's the way the system is, or what? Uh, first, I was angry, uh, still angry at Alan, mm -hmm. and uh, we've been trying to make changes within the system. Mm -hmm. uh, domestic violence is something that needs to be brought to the forefront. Mm -hmm. It's no longer at the point where people can say, well, the man, he is the king, and whatever the king says is it. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it just can't go on anymore. Mm -hmm. So no one told her that he was out on an eight-hour pass? No. About sometime in January, his mother called Lisa and said uh, that uh, Alan's getting a pass and you better get out of town because he's out for revenge. Uh, at that time, Lisa called up to the prison and she called, got a hold of the prosecutor and uh, she wrote the letters, everything they told her to do, and she was assured that if Alan was ever getting a pass or out for anything, that she'd be notified. On March 4th of this year, he uh, got a pass. He went to her house. You know, how do you get a pass if you're in prison for threatening to Alan, kill Alan was uh, on what they call a work release. Mm -hmm. And uh, what that is, if you go and do work, like community work in the mm -hmm. area, you're allowed to have a furlough. Mm -hmm. What kind of man is he? Well, one night I sat down and I tried to think of a name that best suit him. I come up with a lot of profanities, but in my opinion, the only thing I can call him is Satan. So you think he is the devil? In my opinion, yes. Certainly represents the devil on earth, you think? Yes, mm -hmm. I do. Was he just, you know, evil toward everybody or just Lisa? Mainly just Lisa. Uh, Lisa was his possession, mm -hmm. uh, and that was all there was to it. We'll be right back. This guest says that at least 1,800 people are killed every year by their ex-spouse or spouses. He is a professor of criminal justice at Northeastern University in Boston and author of this book, Mass Murder. Meet James Fox. We're glad to have you join us. Um, do these people, you know, James set out to be murderers? He just said, he, Mark just said that, that uh, his sister's killer, ex-husband, was evil, was just evil. Well, there are those cases. Uh, we've, heard very, we have, we've heard varying stories today about a man who has, who's consistently abusive and the abuse tends to grow until uh, finally there's an attack on, on the life of his spouse. We've heard stories, a uh, Robin story, where it was more of a controlling nature, not abuse, verbal abuse, yes, but not physical abuse, until one day she tells him that she wants a divorce and he reacts violently. So it's very difficult to foresee. That's the problem here. Many people threaten to kill, and they don't kill. Mm -hmm. What we see here is uh, the saddest stories, the ones where these people have gone through these cases, and fortunately they've survived, and in one case have not survived. So when a person threatens to kill you, when are, are the chances, what are the chances that that person will? Well, the chances are very good that nothing will ever come of it. Most threats are idle threats. That's not very much comfort to these people, of course. Right. Um, it's a very perplexing and difficult question as to what should you do yeah, in this that... sort of situation. Restraining orders, as we've heard, are not very effective. Uh, the police can really only do something if the person comes to the house and starts to be violent. Other than that, there's little that they can do. Isn't that just a ridiculous law, though? Well, one, it, you, you think it's ridiculous in, in, when you hear these cases, but we have to keep in mind that there are millions of cases a year of complaints, of threats, of intimidations that do not end in violence. We really can't, in this society, go around and arrest all the people who make threats. But, it's, but shouldn't, the th shouldn't the threats be put in categories? Because there are some threats that are more serious than others. Mm -hmm. So if someone has slashed your tires, for instance, and then threatened you, then that, to me, is a more serious threat than someone just standing out across the street saying, I'm going to kill you. But by our, our, by our laws, if someone slashes your tires and says they're going to kill you, we can punish him for the tires, but we can't punish him for something he says he's going to do. We punish for behavior. We cannot punish for words. You can never punish for somebody who has shown every clear indication that they might actually go through with it. Might is there's still a chance that they won't. That's the way our laws are set up. We may mm -hmm. not like it. Mm -hmm. We may not like it, but in our free society, we still have to realize that until someone is violent, we can't put them in prison. Mm -hmm. There are precautions we can take 
certain good ones, such as trained dogs, uh, I wouldn't recommend own gun ownership because the gun can be turned against yourself, much more likely. Um, one, if necessary, has to move. Now, I, I understand that, that one doesn't want to feel like a victim and feel like you have to move because of what this person is doing to you. But it's much better to be a live chicken than a dead duck. Well, if they said they're going to threaten the president, they will have him arrested. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't they have him arrested if they said they're going to kill you? <laughs> You're just Because that person isn't the president. They can call, they can be in your house. I had a case where the person was in my house using a hammer, beating my door, and the police told me there is nothing that we could do about it, Mrs. Harris. We're sorry, we'll just have to ask him to leave. It's sad. It is a sad situation. And I'm her not point saying is that, that the I'm not saying our system is a good one. The president's life is more valuable. More valuable than I don't think I don't think the president's life is more valuable than anyone else. A life is a life, and a human being is a human being. I agree. <clears throat> Why are the laws so bad? I was just saying. I was saying to Geraldine uh, before the show that I do think, and this is perhaps sexist of me. I do think that if if this was a society in which these things were happening to men, and men could fall to uh, as such victims, that the laws would perhaps change. What do you think, James? Well, it does happen to men. Not as much as it happens to women, I, I have to agree with that. In these domestic kind of cases, in fact, 40% of the time it's the man that's killed and the woman. Still, there are threats, there are death threats. I get death threats. I'm not sure you might as well. In our society, we still can't put pe people in prison for what they say they're going to do because most of the people who say it don't actually do it. A lot of people say things in anger, in bitterness, but will not carry it out. You wanted to share what with us? Yes, um, I, have, I had a boyfriend, an ex-boyfriend that I was going with for, four, for, for two years, but we just recently broke up four months ago. And he has threatened that he would, you know, that he would... Um, kill me if I'd ever break up with him. Well, I did break up with him, and since then he's harassed me, and he's had his friends harass me, and um, he's done like all different sorts of things to me, and um, and including break your arm or something. Yeah, it's fractured. That in my eye was um, was hemorrhaging too, and um, he's gotten to the point where he's constantly lingering around the house, and the police won't do nothing about it. He's done everything that you could po probably possibly think of as far as, you know, um, doing things like, you know, hanging around the house and following me, and he calls all the time, and he threatens that he's going to kill me, and he's just done all kinds of things, and um, I just don't know what to do about it. I'm really afraid. You went to the police. Did you get an um, order of protection? You can get that whether he's touched you or not. No, they said, said I verb cannot. Verbally they said you. I cannot. But, well, that doesn't work. No, but he's they physically said I abused you. He broke your arm. And did you go to the police for that? Yes, I did. And what happened? Um, they won't do anything for me because he had a mask on. Even though I could identify him, he's talked to me. Um, what happened is I had gotten out of the car and he was to the left of me and I went to open up into the trunk to get a package out of the trunk and he came around to the left of me and he punched my chest and I had fell. And he just started swinging and hitting me and punching me, and he had told me, now you're going to get it. And then he swore at me, and um, he just continued. But he had a mask on during this whole time? Yes, he did. This was so, Halloween? Yes, it was Halloween. So he's like 6'4", and he weighs like 200 pounds. So mm -hmm. you can imagine what he could, probably could have done to me. But my mother... So the police heard, say you can't pr prosecute because he had a mask on? Right, exactly. Even though you heard his voice, and even though... You know, I knew who it was, um, the clothes and everything, they still won't do anything at all for me. What's her recourse here? Well, what she, what she should have did was not to tell the police in the first place that he had a mask on. You knew who the person was that attacked you. This individual had a low self-esteem about himself, and what he's doing is trying to lower your self-esteem, and a lot of them do, because that's what happened to me and therefore they get you right where they, at, where they want you at and then they continue this abuse and see what the results. This has happened to too many females across the country. Mm -hmm. there, there, there should be full force of the law when Thank there's you. violence involved, whether it's domestic <laughs> violence or the violence that happened to yourself. Uh, I certainly agree with you. It's only when the threats are never associated with violence that the law cannot do anything. 
So if there is some association with violence, even if it's... Then it's an assault. Then it's an assault. But you can't put them in long enough to really do any good, or can you? They let them out the next day because the police was supposed to let supposed to warn me about them releasing Tim. They had his father and him both in jail at the same time, and he made a mistake and released the wrong one. Ellen. Do you still have Tim at your home now? Thank God. That's the only person I have to thank. No. Because um, I told him to send me to prison. And he was in the courtroom holding on to my dress. And I said, please, put the handcuffs on me. Get me out of here. He said, please don't take this woman away. Who's going to take care of me and these kids? And the only thing I hurt, it hurts me to my heart out of the whole thing, was my baby, my son. He screamed out. He said, please, don't take my mama. And that's what bothers me the most. I, I lost my baby because of this man. He destroyed my home, my job, everything. So where's your child? I, I'm getting my children back, but I lost everything I loved, I ever worked hard for. Because, because you wanted to go to jail to get away from Get home. away. To get away. Did and you go to jail? Yes, I did. And spend how much time in jail? The judge, it went all the way from attempted murder to an aggravated assault. They saw, the prosecutor saw they was losing the case so bad on me, they was willing to give me probation. But I say, if you give me probation, he'd still be there. When did the law going to protect us? We'll be right back. <laughs> this kind of person, I know you wrote the book Mass Murder, differs a lot from a person who just kills indiscriminately. Is that not true, James? I'm sorry? The kind of person who makes threats against your life and harasses you and harasses you is, is a lot different than the person who just kills indiscriminately or what appears to be indiscriminately. Yes. For, um Fortunately, those who make a lot of threats usually don't carry out those threats. Mass murderers, on the other hand, uh, often don't say anything about what they're going to do and just go out and do it. And many of these mass murders also are these kinds of incidents we're hearing here. Gene Simmons in, in Russellville, Arkansas, for example, his wife was planning to leave him. His kids were going off to college. He was the dictator of the household. He dictated when, every, and when people could come and go, when they could eat, when they could go shopping. And he didn't want to see people leave. He didn't want to see his wife leave. So he shot them all. Killed all 14 two years ago. Yeah. For him, it was better that they're dead than that they leave. Oftentimes, they'll end up killing themselves to try to be together in the afterlife. Is that the point, to be together in the afterlife? No, or it's to the, beat point the, police? Is, the point is that des desertion is a capital crime in their way of thinking. And they'd rather inflict the capital punishment on the, the people who are deserting them, because then they have control. They're the ones who are determining when and how there's a separation, even though that separation is by death. Robin, did your husband ever threaten to kill you and kill, turn the gun on himself? On the morning of the assault, yes, the SWAT team surrounded our house while <coughs> I had already been taken to the hospital and was getting ready to undergo surgery. and. Um, the police informed me later that they did find uh, suicide notes to our children and uh, one to me, but I, they never gave me the notes, so I don't know what they said. Mm -hmm. um, the man who killed your sister, where is he? He's in the county jail. Uh, he's had postponements on top of postponements. His trial comes up in January. Uh, he was scheduled to go back to prison, but uh, the judge said it was all right for him to stay in the county jail because it was too far for his lawyers. Go back to prison. Hmm. What are you going to do? Your husband's getting out, ex-husband's getting out on Monday. What are you going to do, Patty? I don't know. Hide in my room, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. What would you tell her to leave. do, James? I tell her if she, I, I, I prefer she move and try to get her far away as possible. <laughs> Thanks for watching The Best of the Oprah Show. I'll see you next time.